to get it started. That's not what I meant to do. Hold on. <laughs> I have a former former life and um, as a farmer uh, and continue to dabble in it for fun every year. And I hope all of you on the call today have had opportunity this beautiful spring to dig in the dirt a little. Um, so again, welcome. I'm Christy Urquhart. I'm the Associate Director of SHC, and I am happy to introduce Chris Link today, our uh, Community Farm Manager, and also happy to have on our panel today, Jess Lagus, who is the Director of our Farmland Program. So um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of SHC's overall farmland uh, program, and then I'm going to hand it off to Chris. Uh, to give the majority of the presentation today. Uh, we all welcome questions, and so feel free to type those into the chat or the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to all of those uh, questions at the end of the presentation, so we'll leave enough time for uh, questions, comments. Yeah, so um, as most of you know, um, SHC was formally incorporated in 1974, and that was out of a small group of committed individuals who were very involved in the Appalachian Trail Conference, now Conservancy, at the time. And our land protection work was really focused on the highlands of Rhone and along the viewshed of the Appalachian Trail and really high elevation habitat conservation work. In 1991, when I began working with the organization, there was a need for us to expand our conservation work, in particularly around the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. There was a need, a lot of development pressure there, and also in the Black Mountain region. And so as one of the country's oldest land trusts, we really felt um, that we needed to kind of step it up some in our conservation work regionally and really look at the vision of our founding fathers and mothers, which were a, a large greenway of conservation lands across the whole Southern Appalachians. And so in 1991, we did expand that conservation work to the focus areas we have today. Um, in 2005, we saw that the country, and in particular our region, were losing a lot of agricultural working lands across the country due to development pressure and also due to the aging farmer population. So as these farmers were aging, they were very land rich but cash poor. And so their farmland was the asset that they had. And a lot of them were forced into selling that asset because their um, heirs were not interested in continuing the farm or they didn't have enough capital con to continue that. And really the real estate market had a whole lot of funds that they could give them. Um, and so there was that need to do some, to really strategically look at protecting agricultural land in particular. And how could us as a land trust respond to that work? So we did establish our a real focus on agricultural farmland protection in 2005. Um, and so then in, and when I say respond, I wanna say that the purchase of those conservation easements for those farmers enabled them to have capital that they could then invest into their farm and continue to own the land and work the land. Um, so they wouldn't have to sell it off for development. And then in 2010, SHC was giving what we now call our, our community farm in Alexander, North Carolina, 100 acres. And we thought, how can we best utilize this asset to meet community needs and also reach the goals of the organization? And so we came up with a plan to um, really look at what were the barriers to access in terms of far farming, in terms of local food production, um, in terms of livelihood, and also um, opportunities 
for us to create some diversified income streams for the organization that can then take those funds and put it back into our farmland program. In those diversified income streams that are happening on the farm, some examples are renting the space out for events and weddings. Um, we have short-term rentals at the farmhouse there that brings in income. And then we did a whole stream bank restoration project there and a mitigation banking initiative um, where we actually sell those credits to uh, folks who are doing development that might be um, having an impact in the French Broad River corridor um, in a on a development project and they need to do a mitigation um, plan. So that's kind of where we are today in terms of some of the things that we're doing and I don't want to take up too much time and I'm going to hand it over to Chris who's going to kind of touch a little bit on that on what we're currently doing on the farm. And yeah, take it away, Chris. Thanks, Christy. Hello, everyone. For those of you who have, who have not met me, my name is Chris Link. I manage our community farm uh, and the different projects and programs there and related to it. Um, so thanks, Christy, for that great intro and history uh, of farmland access uh, related to SHC. Um, so the write-up for this Lunch and Learn was quite broad, um, a little overwhelming to tackle all of those pieces. Uh, so today we're going um, to focus on parts of the uh, local food system, mainly circling around the access piece for farmers. Um, so as mentioned, um, and we luckily we have Jess here today uh, uh, for questions too around conservation easements and other specifics around the, the, uh, protect, the land protection. Um, but I always try to share the, um, this, this graphic or slide around like what a conservation, I usually present this to farmers, what's a conservation easement, what's that purchase mean, what does it look like? And uh, as Christy mentioned, um, you know, putting an easement on a piece of property we can a lot of times extract capital for that difference in value of the easement versus the development value. And we can take that and help support the farmers financially with capital to, to do all kinds of different things um, to keep them on the land and to keep the land in production um, or in conservation. Uh, and so this is just an example of if you had a $500,000 piece of land, uh, the left column there shows it can be farmed, developed, used for any purpose. Um, and so the price of the land is five hundred thousand uh, dollars. With a in the column B, with the easement, which is that light green block of value, um, there's restricted development, um, and so the value is reduced uh, from the perspective of um, it can't be subdivided, uh, and therefore there is a lowering of value. So if land already had an easement, the idea is, and of course this isn't always the case, especially regionally here, the value would be lowered because of that restriction of development uh, and use. And so making it more um, approachable financially, uh, potentially for a farmer uh, and or for, for uh, food production and otherwise. So that, that's kind of the general slide that I, that I pop up. Um, and I'm gonna be focusing on the community farm and land access connected to that. Uh, but we do have a conservation easement with the county on the community farm. Um, and as Jess and I were doing yesterday, we're working on another one on, on the adjacent property that we uh, acquired a couple years ago uh, to expand that. So um, cool, great. I'm gonna jump in now uh, to just a little bit about the community farm. As Christy mentioned, the farm was donated to us in 2010 and there have been many different projects uh, started then and started since. And so uh, we have the stream project, we have a, a shortleaf pine reforestation project of 15 acres. We have uh, a discovery trail that is an educational trail that we hike folks through. It's about two miles and we're expanding that now onto our uh, adjacent property of 37 acres that expands us to 140-ish acres total um, contiguous. Uh, we also, on that site, do all types of volunteer activity, community outreach. Uh, we hold workshops there, which I'll touch on. Um, and we have our farmer incubator program, which will be 
a portion of what I'm gonna talk about uh, that's related to land access. So yes. And again, the uh, most of these projects and programs really were started and got up and running in 2013-ish. Um, yes, so without that generous donation of this farm, this isn't a property that SHC would have historically been seeking or looking to purchase. So uh, Christy, Carl, all the folks that were involved at that time saw this opportunity and we've been able to do so much out there um, and have a lot of different impact in so many different ways because of that. So just to speak to what that donation has meant, um, it's hard to even imagine back then what it could do. Uh, so I mentioned the incubator program. So here we are with land access. Uh, one of, the, one of the programs that we see throughout the country is this idea of an incubator program. So we implemented, started our program at the end of 2014. The idea is that it is a really a business incubator for farmers is how I share it. Um, people who are incubator think chicken. Uh, it can be for any type of production. So we've had everything, uh, you know, that's including agroforestry, that's including uh, uh, you know, uh, forest farming, mushrooms, it's livestock, it's vegetables. Uh, currently it's flowers, vegetables, herbs. Um, so it can just, it can include any kind of production. And a lot of incubator programs are for new Americans, uh, over half in the country, meaning folks that are new Americans and uh, are bringing their cultural relevant uh, foods that they want to grow. So a lot of them are, are that set up. Um, we, have, uh, a, we have different parts of the farm that are for different types of production, but um, when folks apply to the incubator program, they have to give us a business plan, um, they have to give us a resume, uh, their finances to see that they have the capital to even get this going, and we have a whole process for vetting folks, um, and they can stay on the farm three to five years, really three years, and we've had about uh, eight graduates. We're about to graduate another next month. And um, we have currently have four farmers uh, utilizing the community farm uh, in the incubator program. So with that said, uh, I'm gonna show a little bit more uh, in terms of what, you know, who has accessed, how they've accessed and what that means. So we've saw the incubator program as a stepping stone in the, in the challenge of land access, especially in this region. So uh, you might see a farmer who is starting out or a person who just wants to farm um, in whatever capacity that is. A lot of times they're, they will first go to an apprenticeship program or an internship or take classes and learn more about what they want to do. Um, and then potentially after that, we're kind of that next potential stepping stone of, okay, I'm not ready to invest all this capital or I don't have the capital, I don't have the client base, um, and I don't have enough experience running strictly my own business, um, which aside from apprenticing, you know, you're not running your own business. So there are so many more pieces involved when it's all your operation. And so the incubator program and infrastructure land base means that that farmer doesn't have to come up with all the capital costs to get it up and running. That's irrigation, that's tractors, that's greenhouses, that's wash and packing facilities, uh, coolers, all these different things. Um, in addition to the land itself, of course, leased or purchased, um, it's a huge capital investment. So that's one piece of the incubator program to take away some of the stress and some of the pressure of that piece of it, of those capital investments. And then in addition to that, they have the, um, they have the support uh, and technical expertise from us as staff. Uh, and they also have the um, network uh, that we share and utilize. So I, I typically say this for later, but we, we partner up with different organization and groups in the area, ASAP, Organic Grower School, um, FarmLink, among many others um, that help us provide, share, what's needed for a farmer to get up and running. So we, uh, we work with OGS to provide a beginning farmer uh, curriculum, which is farm beginnings. And then we use FarmLink to find lands and to find farmers that are in need of those two alternating things, in need of land or, uh, a, far, uh, or a landowner who wants to share their land. 
so that's that's kind of the overview of the incubator program. We have a whole fee structure that's very affordable, so that the farmers uh, can access that um, all the all that infrastructure. It's based on what they access, and um, what we're seeing now and what we've seen over the past few years is initially it was very inex more inexperienced farmers that were needing that 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 that, that early support, and now we're seeing even a lot more applicants that are that are more experienced farmers. So we currently have farmers that have uh, between five and almost 10 years experience on the community farm um, that are in need of, 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 what we, of what we have to offer. So that's a lot on this page, but uh, it's a lot of what we do um, in terms of our programming. Um, so in addition to our, our incubator program, we also uh, have multiple other uh, infrastructure and programs this is a page that just shows some of that infrastructure and some of our past graduates. So uh, here we have vegetable farmers, flower farmers, uh, livestock, cattle, sheep, um, all who have utilized and some have gone on to continue farming. Some have bought their own land. Some are in uh, politics or extension work. So it's kind of all over the board. Um, and these are just some photos of our community farm and the different productions that have happened out there. I like showing photos because it, it gives a face to all the words and, and, and talking that I'm doing so you can actually see what it looks like on the ground. Um, and luckily through Community Foundation of Western North Carolina support and through um, donors and, and our stream bank the mitigation credit sales, we've been able to expand. We now have four growing tunnels. We're gonna soon have two wash packing areas uh, a larger walk-in. So we've really been able to expand um, what we're able to offer in some of that infrastructure. Great. Um, and at the end, I'll share some of our information so that if you want to connect with any of our farmers that we have out there um, or any of the other programming, you'll be able to do that. So in addition, as I was just saying, there, there is other support that we provide. Um, one big thing being our workshop, our farmer workshop, uh, workshop series, we call it. Uh, basically, we choose anywhere between 10 to 13 topics, subjects uh, every year and have since 2015, really. Uh, we, we backed off during the pandemic uh, doing some virtual work, uh, but we provide uh, content that's relevant for farmers to come in, learn, uh, usually hands-on, and then walk away and be able to have something to actually implement uh, or to make not just implement, but also to have information to make their work either more efficient, more safe. Um, so it varies from everything from pasture walks, food safety modernization act information, tractor 101 for women, two wheel tractor, how to move your body on the farm, uh, gap certifications. We've done a season extension, um, livestock fencing, all kinds of different workshops all across the board. Um, and this year we're teaming up with our farmers on site, our incubator farmers to provide some more content uh, at the community farm. Um, and I'll mention our farm associate whose folks have maybe have been a, a attended their lunch and learn um, a couple months ago and what they're accomplishing and doing on the farm. I'll touch on too. Um, yeah, so this is just a photo, some photos of some of our of some of our workshops, and we have uh, pro professionals, uh, farmers. Um, we do some stuff, some of the workshops in house uh, to provide all these different topics, and that's also through different partnerships uh, in our network too. Great. So again, farmers accessing land, they can also access our value added kitchen. This is a big piece. So when we were looking at, okay. Um, with incubator farmers, with farmers in general, we're running up against, okay, great, we have the access to land, the markets are still not super easy. Um, and I know that was in part of the write-up of today's Lunch and Learn. Markets can be a real big challenge and they can also be uh, sometimes a, a moving target in some ways. So, so what we were able to create and one way that we were able to, um, to address that in a small way, uh, compared to other to other ways that we that that other organizations can address market we were able to create our value added kitchen at the farm um, this serves multiple purposes uh, from the venue space event space and then also helps to 
provide a space for not only on-site farmers, but community members in general to come out and take their raw product and make it more valuable, more shelf stable, so that that can uh, create more profit for the farmer. Um, and so we've had multiple different uh, farmers and other bakers and other folks that have used our, our, our value-added kitchen space. And we're excited because we kind of finished it up at the end of uh, just at the beginning of COVID. So we're excited to finally open this, start to open this back up for folks to come use it. Um, uh, and we have already had some of these folks, Dogwood Cottage Baking, uh, that's a baker who uses space and was able to start a brick and mortar uh, location uh, in Woodfin just this past year. So also our farmers on site have utilized it. And we also have education and different workshops, cooking, preserving in that space as well. That's another way that we're starting to address some of the market challenges that farmers face. <clears throat> So moving on, so I mentioned someone a few minutes ago, and that's uh, Tamaria Sims as our farm uh, community farm associate. So we have been moving in a direction of, um, especially since COVID started, this is all 2020, 21 photos. Uh, how, can we, how can we expand what we're doing a bit um, within our capacity while still having uh, some, some secondary impacts? So growing food for donation um, and that includes, was including just vegetables. We've expanded it to um, organic fed egg production as well. And we're looking at other ways that we can help um, address the food insecurity, especially in the marginalized communities and the communities that don't have that food access, nutritional food specifically. So um, tomorrow has been doing amazing work, growing food for donation. And we're just getting back into that on the farm this year. So this isn't necessarily a land access piece. This is more of, we, ha we have access to the land. How can we have more impact um, for folks that cannot maybe access land to grow their own food? And so uh, we've been doing this now for two years and we're expanding into one of our new tunnels with production. And we'll be continuing this through, through, the, through the fall and winter as well. Um, and in addition to that, we're also um, going into communities and supporting communities uh, with their community gardens and, and, and growing that's being done actually in the gardens that are in those communities, partnered up with Bountiful Cities and um, other organizations in town. So it's just another piece uh, of what we're doing. And the idea is that the sale, the sale of some of these goods subsidizes our ability to, to donate and also keep everything we're doing meeting our, our operating costs for those different projects. So there's a photo of one of our hoop houses growing winter greens um, and some of our donation drop-off points uh, in Asheville. And of course, our volunteers that help us make that happen. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, so, so in addition to, the, to, the, um, to our incubator program, we have our food donations. Uh, and then speaking to the incubator program itself, uh, we're also starting to look at other structures to make that more uh, feasible. And I'll touch on that in just a minute, uh, more financially feasible for farmers specifically. Um, so I mentioned as, uh, as markets, so sorry to, to backtrack a little bit. So markets, for farmers in the area is a big challenge. So let's just say you have the land access piece down, then it's, well, how do I sell enough to be profitable and to make profit and to meet the, the financial needs of the farm? And so um, one thing we're seeing, you know, at, at, as, energy, as energy becomes more expensive, for instance, all goods go up. And so we've seen that happen, especially lately uh, nationally and regionally. And so as we see that happen, a lot of times the, uh, the price point and therefore the profitability of the farmer can go up a little bit just because of the overall cost of food is going up. And that helps farmers to be more um, financially sustainable and actually open the market up to potentially more farmers. So although that can be seen as a real problem, um, the act of buying, uh, being a part of a CSA or buying more local food really helps to um, support these new farmers and for farmers to expand their operations because the market is everything and wholesale, wholesale marketing is 
very difficult on small scale growing operations, which is the majority of what we're working with here. So we have one farmer on a little over a quarter acre. We have another farmer on uh, about a half and another farmer on just under a half acre. So we're talking small amounts of area. And so biointensive growing and good price points for their product is very crucial. So, um, and, and luckily we're able to continue the do donations through that, of course, um, bring even more value to what we're able to provide to those communities. So uh, I just want to touch on that a little bit more. Um, and then my next slide is, I like to, to just, I always show this because um, it's, not a, it's not only a way that folks that are watching this presentation can get involved with SHC, but uh, we rely on volunteers on the community farm and elsewhere in really big ways uh, to have the impact that we have. And I mentioned this during a land access presentation because uh, through our volunteer support, we've been able to um, help farmers in direct ways and second and, and kind of in, in secondary ways. Uh, we've had folks come out and help us have uh, crop mobs or large harvests on the farm to help a farmer that would have been out there on their own do something that would take them two days we could do in just an hour. Um, and through that volunteer support, uh, we've created a lot of relationships and have uh, shown different visitors, you know, what small scale farming looks like and also um, the challenges of that scale of farming and of that uh, more intense method of growing. So um, it's just a shout out to all the volunteers. We've had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers um, over the years. And you can see here, uh, we have kindergarten all the way up through any age, uh, but a lot of uh, college age and high school age groups that come out. They've helped us in our stream project. They've helped us on trail work. They've helped us build new trails. And uh, this also includes businesses in town that come out and help us out, uh, breweries, uh, just, 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 just amazing people that come out and give their time. So uh, we've been able to do a lot with that and we look forward to doing more of that now that folks are getting out more. Um, out there to, to, to help us have more, even more impact. So uh, just another way that um, folks are helping us engage with uh, local uh, community members as well as SHC members and uh, school age children. Um, it's just ha has had huge impact and we've made so many new connections through that. So we appreciate all that support. Um, even one year, uh, just this past year, we had Highland out and we harvested a ton of garlic, which is will be for sale just at our farm stand as it's completed uh, coming up in the next few, in the, in the next month or two. Um, so touching on that, we're, we're hoping to wrap up uh, addressing the, the food desert or the food access piece. We're hoping to wrap up here shortly our, our barn space at the community farm which is connected to the incubator program in terms of infrastructure, but we're gonna have a space where local farmers on site and off site can um, sell some of their goods uh, and address some of the, uh, some, of the uh, some of the access pieces even in that rural community, not just you know, in the more urban context of the area. So we're looking forward to getting that up and running and we hope that that becomes even uh, more of a, a sharing um, and a, a point of touch for the community out there and just the community, the regional community in general. So looking forward to that. So that'll be released in some of our, on, on our website of uh, the opening of that, of that store and that, and that space in the next couple of months. Um, so yeah, so the big question is, um, and this is always a question that we're asking ourselves and getting feedback from other organizations is what's needed for farmers um, currently in, the, in this region uh, to be more successful or just what is the biggest challenge. Um, and what always comes back is pretty much always is, is, is land access, of course, um, but there are multiple other pieces uh, of needs. And so what we've been hearing is, uh, and we've heard this throughout our time running the incubator program and talking about it across the country is that okay, great, we've been here for three to five years, like, can we just stay forever? <laughs> or, you know, um, this, this is one, this is too good to be true. 
Um, and so we've been questioning, okay, well, some folks still have trouble even with their, uh, with their, with their um, tax forms and their experience and their customer base accessing capital for the type of acreage that they're needing, needing to buy more so they can have access to the amount that they need um, or uh, other challenges of just access to that capital at the price point in general. So we have been starting to look at the, the future of where this is going. And so <clears throat> one big piece of, of land access is, okay, what am I gonna get out of putting all this energy and time, blood, sweat, tear into this into this land. Well, you're accessing all the infrastructure, and you're building your your your, your customer base. Um, and folks and farmers usually are, are definitely okay with that. But it's like, how can we access land while also building some equity and also having some security? So we're just starting to look at um, how we could have maybe a little bit longer term land access with minimal. Um, in, uh, staff staff time so that it's actually a reasonable thing to accomplish. And so we've been studying different models and we're, we're starting to shift a little bit in terms of uh, what potentially we can offer. So uh, these are just some photos of what we're, what we're heading towards and that is creating more of an accessible community farm. So up until now we've had horned livestock and we've had uh, you know certain fencing that couldn't provide full access to the farm. So we're hoping to shift more towards, hey, um, do you want to learn about the community farm? Do you want to come out and hike? Great. Uh, you're safe to do that now. Uh, the infrastructure is there. Um, our signage is always there, of course, but you don't have to be led. So we want to create more of a community farm, which is the idea of the word, um, access to, to all that we're doing out there so folks can learn and see what we're doing. Um, and also learn from, our, from the demonstration of what's happening on site, both from what we're doing uh, as, an, as, or, as an organization and as staff, but then also what the farmers on site are doing and how they're growing. So that's where the demonstration piece comes in more. And that's showing how we can be productive on a, on a piece of land, especially in the mountains, where we have such little uh, you know, growing uh, area really compared to other parts of the country, but also showing how we can produce food, create food security, keep dollars local while also, um, you know, being a steward of that of that environment of that land that is producing um, that food, and so whenever we have farmers on any site, there's always that. Of course, the first thing is we're a land trust, we're a conservation organization, so we're always going to have that baseline, foundational piece of how can this be done in a sensitive way that ideally improves can improve the uh, the land, the environment. And so we hope to bring more folks out through our through our projects to show you know how that's done, and so folks can take that away, and maybe implement a piece of that or all of that on their own land or share it with others. Um, and in addition to that, like I was just saying, uh, so so the equity building, it's it's figuring out how we can have a little bit longer term land access with um, with the infrastructure, both programmatically and physically that lends itself to practices that are gonna be environmentally sustainable. And so on the top left photo here, if y'all can see that, it's hard to see. We're moving um, some of our land on the community farm specifically into a agroforestry. Um, this is silvopasture, which is basically grazing livestock uh, through typically perennial productive areas, which this is perennial trees, um, nut trees, fruit trees, et cetera. So we're moving towards um, an infrastructure that creates an experience, but then also has stacked production happening, which is something we've always wanted to work towards. And we're finally seeing that as, as a path here uh, with, with the direction we're going. So um, we're working with other organizations to help, to help make that happen. Um, and so moving towards print, some perennialization of some of our areas, a little more management, but also creating more of an experience for folks that are out on the farm. Uh, to learn, and then also just from the aesthetic beauty that, that's out on the community farm specifically, and many of our other properties, um, for folks to have that experience out there. So that's kind of the direction we're shifting. Longer term land access, uh, more agroforestry, perennial production, and uh, more demonstration uh, of what we're doing and what we hope to see more of. And, we, and, and all of this is through a lens of, of partnerships and uh, education for ourselves and um, 
attendees to our different events and workshops and things. Um, and, that, and that's kind of the end of my presentation. I don't want to wrap without saying um, a couple things. If anyone's interested in volunteering, uh, please see our website. We have, uh, we have volunteer opportunities on there. We have farm tours now at the community farm. We're trying to do monthly. So if you want to learn more, you're welcome to come out and attend one of those hikes. It, goes, it's a, it's, it can be anywhere from a mile to two mile hike not too strenuous um, and you can see everything that I've kind of touched on today um, and, and, and see what's happening on the community farm. Um, and then yes, uh, as Christy mentioned earlier, one of our revenue pieces here is um, short-term rentals and event space uh, rental. So we have an amazing, a beautiful farmhouse that looks out over our, our view shed, our, our mountains, sandy mush and other land we've conserved just really stunning, beautiful place to come stay for uh, friends and family to come stay out there um, on Airbnb. And then we have the event rental space, which can be used for just about anything. We have a uh, kitchen, uh, uh, outdoor um, hardscaped area, just a real beautiful event space. Uh, we just had a wedding yesterday actually out there. It was really a wonderful day for it. Um, and what's happening Sunday. today, Chris? What's happening this afternoon for the first time? Oh gosh. Well, the community uh, at the farmer's market. Yes. Yeah. So, so we've finally, um, we've worked with three interns and now uh, Tamaria Sims, our, our, our community farm associate to, to have uh, organic fed rotated chickens layers laying eggs on the farm. And we are finally selling them today, uh, starting in just a little while for the first time at the River Arts District uh, farmer's market. So if anyone's interested, we're going to be alternating weeks this week and then every two weeks uh, from there on out, uh, alternating with another egg producer, uh, selling our organic fed, soy free feed, pasture raised chicken eggs, uh, about three or four different breeds out there. Um, so if you want to learn more uh, or if you want to get involved in volunteering, we're going to have uh, volunteers that help support that work. And then also uh, we're going to be at the, I believe we're going to be, I'm pretty sure at the new Biltmore Village Farmer's Market, which is just getting started up this year. So we'll be there. Uh, if anyone's interested, connect with us, email, um, and we can uh, go from there. Angela's just reminding me that our community farm hike is coming up, actually. Um, it's Thursday, May 19th, next Thursday. I won't be there. I'll actually be on another property, unfortunately, but uh, Logan, one of our AmeriCorps, who knows all about the farm, will be leading that. So Please uh, follow the link in our chat if you want to sign up for that and come out and just have a, hopefully it'll be a beautiful day. Either way, it's still a really great hike and you can hike through the farmer's uh, production areas. You'll see some livestock um, and just engage and learn more about what we're doing out there. Um, I think that's more or less what I had uh, to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, Christy, Jess, if you want to add anything. I know that was a lot. So we have a question uh, from Christine Best. Are we using the chicken tractors or a, more, or a more permanent structure for the chickens? Thank you, it's a great question. Um, so <clears throat> initially, so we, bought, we, we brought these in as chicks. Um, we actually uh, use a chicken tractor, a mobile chicken tractor on wheels. Um, and we outfitted it to be a, a brooding space as well. So we incubated, we, we raised them in the space and then did a little bit of converting. And that, that uh, chicken tractor uh, egg mobile moved into the pasture. And so we move it weekly. Um, that's our capacity right now to move uh, every week to a new piece of grass. And um, yeah, and we have tons of eggs for sale and they're absolutely delicious. They're just full of... Uh, nutrient dense. Uh, and where did we get the chicken tractor? So the chicken tractor was actually um, uh, through some grant funding, we were able to purchase a base for it. And then through our, our, our internship program years ago, we were able to build that out. And then Tamaria, when Tamaria came onto the staff a couple years ago, yeah. we were able to, to finish the construction of that, of that structure. Um, so we had some high school students. We did. Uh, mm -hmm. as interns that took on that project of building our chicken tractor and hopefully um, now that we're learning to, to, to live better with COVID, um, hopefully those students can come back and be 
engaged in um, the chicken activity, uh, more hands-on. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, and we have amazing volunteers that Tamari's been working with. So we already have volunteers that come out and uh, help feed and harvest the eggs and other volunteers that help wash them, process them a bit. And so uh, we're also looking for volunteers still to come help out uh, at market if anyone wants to get involved with that. It's a great way to socialize, uh, share what SHC is doing as a whole as, as a land trust, and then obviously help sell some really delicious eggs. Chris, we have a question around the value added kitchen. Okay. In particular, what is a value added kitchen and why would folks need to maybe utilize that space over their own kitchen space? That's a fantastic question. Thanks yeah. for asking that. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, what is the process for people to access it? So, um, of that. So the way to access the kitchen is to reach out to me currently directly. Um, we have periodic training. So basically, I get, lead a training where, where, where whoever is interested in using the kitchen comes out and learns all of the parts of the kitchen um, and, and some food safety we cover, of course. And then uh, you, I would share the fee schedule. It's, um, we did a lot of research. So there's Blue Ridge Food Ventures, obviously that folks, everyone's heard of, I'm, I'm sure, in Asheville. Uh, and then there's other value-added kitchens. That's a full-blown kitchen, but people do value-added work there. Um, and then there's other kitchens like um, up in Marshall, the extension office has a value-added kitchen. And so there's a range of infrastructure in value-added kitchens and there's a corresponding cost with that typically. Um, and so what we did was we were able to utilize some of, our, um, some of our kitchen equipment from the renovation of our office that was previously a kitchen. And we were able to utilize some of those costly pieces to help get it uh, kind of up and going. Um, and then we, we found a middle ground of, it's not as primitive as, or as limited as a home kitchen. And if you have any animals in the house, you can't use your home kitchen as a value-added kitchen as a side note, which is the case for a lot of folks. Um, but uh, we saw a middle ground of people don't, a lot of folks don't need that Blue Ridge Food Ventures level of infrastructure, but they need more um, than what uh, is provided at that extension value-added kitchen and the location is closer to Asheville and easy to access. And so, and, and the price point is in between those two. And so we found that there was a need for that, everything that I just kind of talked about there, uh, specifically for farmers, but for other folks that just couldn't cook in their kitchen. If you can cook in your kitchen, fantastic, great. Yeah, there's, there's definitely no need to you know, if you can meet all the requirements, there's no need to be at a value added kitchen. And, um, and, and just touch, just touch on what is value added and what that means, Chris, give an exa couple sure. of examples of that for folks who are on the call that may not know what that is. Sure. So there's that like traditional example I give of you want to make tomato sauce or something like that, where you have tomatoes, peppers, uh, other ingredients from off site, and you want to make them into something that's shelf stable and that you can sell throughout the year tomato sauce. Um, what we've seen since opening the kitchen is other interesting stuff like like mushroom jerky. I had never thought of mushroom jerky, but uh, folks have created mushroom jerky. We've ended up with bakers who, um, so not necessarily farmers, but folks that just need access to that kitchen space. Uh, we've seen bakers, we've seen curing, we've seen um, herb processing, uh, other examples of fermenting. Other Fermenting, yeah, a lot of fermenting has been done in there. So other examples of, of value-added products, it's really anything aside from a few things um, <laughs> like bottled water and certain meats, um, a lot, there's like a wide array of things that folks may wanna come preserve, can create some shelf stability for um, so that it's processed into another product essentially. We've also seen the, uh, Candy ginger, um, so candying of things, um, just a, just 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 all kinds of just all kinds of of new ideas that people come with too, uh, like that like the like the mushrooms for instance. Uh, we're also going to utilize that. We've actually utilized that. So there was actually the utilization of using the other side of that space for um, some trial. Uh, what am I trying to say? Um, hemp growing years ago, and mm -hmm. we use the space for processing of hemp even. Um, 
But the, the piece that's great about our kitchen too is that it has capacity. So we have a triple wash, a double wash sink, a hand wash sink. We have a big refrigerator, freezer. We have <clears throat> a hood system with an oven, a cooktop. We have an ice machine um, and we have other, um, you know, tabletop type uh, pieces of equipment. So it's also the access to all of that infrastructure that helps too, um, not just the space itself. And we work with uh, the USDA, which is NCDA here, uh, to coordinate with their person, to with the inspector that comes out and runs through a process for the farmer so they can then run that process um, without that inspector there all the time and have a, uh, a product that they can continue to produce. So we work, we work with uh, NCDA too to support uh, the, the actual process of what it takes to for a, someone who doesn't know what they're doing to come in and go from zero and then walk out with a product that they can sell at market or retail. Thank you for giving those examples. Yes, Christina. Oh, great. Yes, mushroom jerky sounds like a lot of fun. Um, we uh, we also just had a workshop on mushroom log inoculation uh and that went really well so we're actually going to have we have two, we're going to have two sites at the community farm now of kind of in-house uh, we had logs that we added to that workshop so that we could have demonstration logs on site too so we'll actually have some mushrooms out on the farm too maybe we'll make some uh some uh different types of products with that we'll see i think shiitake and oyster Blue oysters, golden, shiitake. I don't know if we had lion's mane or not. We've found, we've foraged for lion's mane on the community farm before, but I don't know. Mm, making me hungry. It. Yes, mushrooms are. Do you have any other questions? Yes, yeah, Sarah Murphy. Um, so how did all these things help uh, how do these initiatives help increase the food security and resilience of a region? So um, the workshop alone, um, so our workshops, I think of the workshops when I think of increasing um, food security in addition to the literal growing of food, because that's, that's obvious that um, growing food is helping to, to minimize that a bit. But the reach that we've had, we've had hundreds of participants in our workshops over the years. Um, and the feedback that we've had from that is that a lot of these farmers have been able to take this information um, and take it home and create a lot more um, efficiencies and even expanded production. And I think that's one of the more larger far reaching ways than just growing, you know, a hundred bunches of collards or something like that, that we've been able to have more further far reaching impact. So, um, I can think of multiple examples of where that's occurred, but um, I mean, I can give a quick one just from our farm design workshop. A, a farmer who's well known in the region um, was going to start growing in a specific area of this property that he had just purchased, and we did a we used his site as an example um, of that of a case study for that farm design workshop. And that area, if he had started growing in it seems obvious, but it's not as obvious as you think, um, would have been way too wet and potentially flooded, <clears throat> um, kind of an ephemeral situation, uh, would have flooded out. And so he reoriented everything, even the siting of his house um, to make that you know not occur and, um, and change the type of production that happened in that area. I mean, that, that, that alone could have had some serious implications uh, for loss, but then also just, um, uh irrigation design was a big one we had a lot of feedback mm -hmm. about that folks just having a big challenge around irrigation um we were able container to get gardening is another one that was very popular how to grow mm -hmm. food in containers wherever very you thirsty. live yeah mm -hmm. yeah container gardening was a big one um and then also season extension was a really mm -hmm. big one. we had six i think 50 some people show up for that it was one of our earlier workshops um and we covered everything uh, we just covered everything uh, for season extension and a lot of folks were able to, and we looked at everything on site. So we were able to look at the actual stuff we were talking about and it, people said, you know, wow, it, you know, it helped make sense and I can see how it works now. And they were able to go back to their properties 
be it farms or home gardening. I mean, we have we have gardeners, we have community, we have everyone attend these workshops. They were to go, we were able to go home and actually implement some of those season extension techniques, varietal selection, you know, cover, um, uh, just different growing techniques to help this with season extension. Um, Chris also really liked the example of the workshop we did about the Coolbot partnering with Coolbot mm -hmm. and how folks can affordably get produce to market mm -hmm. so they can pick it and get it to market. If you want to give that example, that's always, I think, a good one. Great example. Uh, the the community foundation got of uh, Western North Carolina got behind that one too and, and helped us buy a, we took an enclosed trailer and did a design build over two days of a um, mobile walk-in cooler, we call it. So um, I'm sure people have seen this before, but but basically um, taking a, a, a metal enclosed trailer, insulating it, putting an air conditioner in it, adding the cool bot, which is a, a, a piece of hardware and software that trick an air conditioner into thinking that it's warmer than it is, which means the air conditioner keeps cooling down until it's at 38 degrees for vegetables. Um, you can change the temperature setting, but folks were able to go, I know one, I know, I know two different, I know, uh, uh, I know two different, one an organization and one farmer who went back and actually built a walk-in cooler from, from that workshop and having that hands-on component meant like, that's pretty overwhelming, something like that to step into for sure, uh, if you don't have experience. And so it was like cutting that first hole in the side of the trailer, um, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's some of it's just like empowering folks to try something that they may not try otherwise, just out of that first step um, kind of challenge. And so, yeah, folks went back and were able to expand their production, partly because they had more cooling capacity for storage and taking it to market and then keeping it cold at market and then having a way to market it after market if it wasn't sold, um, be it wholesale or otherwise. And resilience of the, resilience of the region, um, that's just like a huge resilience. Um, there's so many ways to be resilient, but if if you're if if we're increasing food security, if we're increasing regional food production, then we're increasing regional economic security in some way because dollars stay local. They don't go to Cisco or whoever it may be. Um, let's say a local restaurant's buying a lot of their stuff locally. That money's going back <clears throat> to a farmer who's in is going to go purchase something locally to help their farm or do whatever they're going to mm -hmm. do. So economically, uh, it helps to keep dollars local, which is resilience of a region as well. Uh, environmental like we could have a whole workshop on just that Jess yeah. you probably have a couple of things to add yeah. to in terms of land protection yeah, yeah I'd have to say um, you know just incubating the next generation of farmers generally in a region I mean national I guess everywhere but um, the farmer population is aging so I think you know educating and, and incubating the next generation of farmers is critical for food resilience and security in the region and then um Chris touched very briefly on our easement program, which permanently protects the future, current and future agricultural productivity of agricultural land. Um, and so having that land base, especially in a rapidly developing region like ours, which also kind of feels like it's everywhere right now, um, is I think critical to protecting the current, the present and future um, resilience of our food systems. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope that touched on your your question, Sarah. Um, yes, and I and I will mention just to just uh, so we have we have the partnership with NC Farm Link and um, Organic Grower School, which is called which we call Farm Pathways. You won't see that advertised much, but Farm Pathways um, uh, that that's really helped. We've brought farmers to the incubator program and to other long term or other pieces of access to other lands. We've brought folks through that partnership um, and a lot of farmers, both incubator and obviously offsite have taken the farm beginnings course. And so um, those folks staying locally, uh, if they learn all that information and then go implement, like it's just another piece of stacking the, stacking that um, impact. Um, hopefully leading towards resilience. We also have farmers who end up on our on conserved land without us really even being involved a whole lot that are doing amazing things and amazing work, um, which we should probably showcase at some point in the future. Um, so 
yeah, a lot of different, a lot of different ways that occurs. If that makes sense. Cool. Does anyone have any other questions? I know we're pushing up against one. Let's see. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, Christine, the um, <clears throat> the veteran farmer apprenticeship. Yeah, that's an amazing. It's some amazing work they're doing. Um, there are so many resources in them. It's overwhelming. Um, like you could be at a, you could be at the, you could be at the organic grower school uh, conference and then be at an ASAP workshop and then be at a down in Hendersonville at another. Uh, I mean, there's just there are a whole lot of resources. I think organic grower school does a great job of kind of putting mm -hmm. everything in one in, in one location. Um, so we mm -hmm. always send folks to them. Um, uh, uh, and if you're not part of the craft program, the Collaborative Regional Alliance of Farmer Training Craft, um, Organic Grower School runs that. And uh, through craft, you get to visit, uh, they do farm visits throughout the growing season, typically throughout the year. Um, and you can see how, ask questions uh, and see how other farmers are doing things that, that maybe you're interested in too. Yes. All right. Do you have anything else to add, Christy or Jess? I don't see any more questions. Yes, forest farming. I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us today for the Lunch and Learn. Um, we will have more Lunch and Learns in the future. So keep an eye out on our website and through our e-news. And I want to thank Chris and Jess for being here today Yeah, to share their expertise to the group. So I hope everybody has a lovely afternoon and get outside and get in the dirt. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.